Hello and welcome back to Leatherheads Footy. My name's Morgan and we are back for 2023. Really excited. It's going to be a big year. I've got big plans. So if you want to come along for the ride, jump on board, subscribe on Facebook, oh, on YouTube, jump on the Instagram at Leatherheads Footy and Spotify as well at Leatherheads Footy. Going to have the audio for all these as a podcast on Spotify and going to be putting the slides and any other visual content on the Instagram. I only got like 31 followers at the moment. So if you can uh, follow along there. But without further ado, let's get stuck in Adelaide Crows fantasy preview for 2023. I'm going to be doing these with hopefully a blend of information and hopefully go quite deep into the fantasy, fantasy stuff with a focus on particular game style and digging a little bit deeper into trends and stuff like that so that we can get a really good whole picture of how certain teams play, how that'll affect not only the players on that team, but you can look at it when you're looking at captain selections against particular teams, matchups, taggers, yeah, stuff like that. So the Adelaide Crows, it's a good team to start with because they've got a really obvious game plan watching them play, but also looking at the stats. They play a really, really high pressure, high contested style of game plan. They're first in the competition for stoppages. They're first for tackles. Those two kind of go hand in hand. Most of your tackles will come around the stoppages and most of your tackles tend to lead to stoppages as well. So it makes sense that they'd be first in those two. And understandably as well, being the number one stoppage and tackling team in the competition, they've got the first and second most tackles by average in the competition in Sam Berry and Rory Laird. Now Rory Laird, the number one scorer in AFL fantasy in the competition as well helped by his tackles, but also bulk possessions. We'll get to him in more detail later on. And as you can see, the contested possession percentage is the second highest of any team. Gold Coast are the only team with a higher contested possession percentage. And then once they win the ball from this um, stoppage area, they I think they're fourth for clearances. So they're not winning heaps and heaps of clearances but when they do win it they don't muck around with the footy they don't play a high possession style they play a very direct low possession style of game so seventh for handball you're going to get higher handballs when you're a high stoppage team just because you're trying to get out of that congestion but then once they're out of that congestion 18th for kicks and 18th for marks so they don't, they don't chip the ball around they just go direct try to get it out by hand but then just go as quick and as direct as they can towards goal 15th overall for fantasy points. So even though they've got the highest fantasy score in the game and the two highest tacklers in the game, they're 15th for fantasy points because once it leaves that stoppage area, there's really not much in the way of fantasy points with possessions to go around. And most of the time, the opposition will have the ball when it's outside of that stoppage area. The top scorers at the Adelaide Crows reflect this game style. They're almost all mids and then the Ruckman with the exception of Jordan Dawson. And this probably speaks to how good of a fantasy player he is and how good of a player he is on the whole. So as I mentioned before, we've got Laird, uh, the number one fantasy player in the game last year. He's in midfielder. He averaged 120, which is right in the upper, upper echelon of players. Hardly anyone averages over 120. We've had rare cases where guys get to like 129, 130, but it's very, very rare. It's not something that happens every year. Yeah, We've had many, many seasons where not a single player has averaged over 120. So 120 is a special average, but Rory Laird is a special fantasy player. He showed that he was a rookie listed, rookie selected, rookie drafted player to begin his career. So started a year later than your normal draftee coming in at 18, but he showed a pretty steady score build, averaged like 60 in his first year, then 70, 80, up to averaging over 100 as a defender, which is also really difficult to do. He was a small defender, rebounding defender, picked up lots of marks, but just very clean at ground level and would just win the footy wherever he goes. And he's shown that now that he's moving to the midfield. This was his third season in the midfield after switching halfway through 2020. And he's just shown the ability, the intensity, the physicality to win the ball wherever he goes. So he's very impressive. I can't really see his score dropping much at all with the Crows game style. One thing I'll also touch on with the game style for the Crows is you sometimes see when a new coach comes in, they'll implement a particular game plan just to get the hang of it, to try and stem the bleeding, not concede too many goals. And then once the team gets better, they'll abandon that game style and move towards something that um, may be a little bit more free-flowing. With the Crows, they performed better last season than they did the season before 
and they actually increased in these pressure numbers, increased in tackles, increased in stoppages, which makes me think that for Matthew Nix, this is actually what he wants to do longer term. This game style is how he sees them competing and winning premierships in the future. So I can't see anything changing. And with that, you'd think that Laird's role and his fantasy output in that midfield is going to be rock solid. Same with these other guys like Keys and Barry Crouch, not so much because he's a little bit in and out in the team, but I'll touch on him a little bit later. So that's Laird at the top there. Dawson averaging 100 as a defender, as I mentioned, very difficult to do. Uh, also first season at the club, quite often you'll see these guys get a bump their first year at the club just because they often come over as a big name recruit, big money, potentially big trade capital being swapped for them. And the club, yeah, it's, it's natural to want to get a good result. It's natural to want to get good return for the fans, to show the fans that you've made the right decision bringing this player to the club. And Jordan Dawson's a fantastic player. Um, a lot spoken about. He's one of the better kicks in the competition. Really long left foot kick. But he's also tall and he's strong. So he's had 10 tackles in a game last year, which is very rare for someone that plays that rebounding defender role. That game, I think, was when he was tagged, and it just shows that he's quite a versatile scorer, which I really like. I like that he doesn't just rely on, for one, getting the ball from his teammates. He can go and win the ball himself. He averages 2.2 intercept marks per game, which is, again, right up there. So he wins the ball back from the opposition himself, and then he also is looked to by his teammates. They'll give him the ball whenever they can because they trust his decision-making and his disposal. I like him. I am a little bit worried, though, with this Crows side. He's by far the most damaging player in the team. Definitely, well, obviously forwards are damaging, but you always have a defender playing on a forward. As far as midfielders and defenders that teams might potentially look to lock down with a tagger, and we're seeing more and more teams are deploying these forward taggers to lock down on these really strong rebounding defenders, I can see Jordan Dawson being the target of a lot more attention in the future because of how important he is and how damaging he is. Someone like a Laird, he would be very hard to tag because he's so strong and plays such an inside role. But Dawson, I think, would be a little bit easier to lock down on. Keys is a guy who, his scoring actually dropped away. I'm not sure. There were murmurs of a bit of an uh, injury later in the year because he started, at the start of the year, he was the number one player in fantasy. And then he dropped away steadily and then towards the end of the year he was actually getting pushed out of that midfield rotation to give younger guys opportunity but he, I think he's still definitely in their best midfield rotation and if he gets back to full health if that was the issue otherwise it's a little bit concerning um, especially given the strength of their midfield it's not exceptional that he was being pushed out uh, when like Sloan was injured it wasn't like they had heaps of guys pushing in if it was an injury issue, I'm looking for him to bounce back with the way that they play. He is a tackler, but he can also win the ball. Really, really high work rate. Getting from these all these contests that the Crows create, getting from contest to contest, he'll get involved a lot. So I can easily see him averaging over 105 again. Riley O'Brien, potentially a little bit disappointing given he, like he's the third ranked Ruckman and... The another two in that top three are Gorn and Grundy, who potentially both drop outside, given that they'll be sharing the ruck duty. We, we really don't know, but I'll, I'll, I'll cover that when I get to the Melbourne preview. But to be getting the most stoppages of any ruck, so the most potential for hitouts, and then still only be ranked third, shows that he's probably not capitalising as much as he could on scoring opportunities. He was getting four tackles a game, so that is nice to see but I'd like to see a little bit more from him. That being said, he's still quite consistent and in a tough year for Rux, he's a guy that you could potentially look towards. Um, something I'll cover a little bit later as well in my overall fantasy learnings is I, I like stacking players from the same team. Um, I'm not sure if it actually makes sense, but it makes sense in my head. Um, I just feel like if you're, if you're going all in on a player from on one player from a team, it makes sense to go all in on a couple because if you're right about one, you'll probably be right that about all of them because if one's winning more of the footy, then generally the team's winning more of the footy. They're playing better. And if, say, one midfielder on a team wins the ball, who are they going to pass it to? They're going to pass it to another midfielder. So you kind of you stack your winnings essentially if you get it right. Of course, the downside risk is this like exacerbated the same as the upside potential. Uh, Crouch averaged the 88, but didn't play that many games. I think he played 11 games and was really in and out of the side. Matthew Nix, obviously not a massive fan of him. The only thing I can put it down to is he's not, 
one, he's not explosive and he's not damaging, uh, but he's still quite a smart, composed decision maker. The only other thing would be his defensive pressure because that's when you look at his stats, he does win enough disposals and he uses the ball pretty well. And he wouldn't call Laird or Barry particularly damaging, but they tackle really hard. And particularly watching the Amazon doco making their mark, you saw Matthew Nix, like, in particular, spell it out to his mids, Brad Crouch left at the end of this season, just saying, if you're not going to defend, you can't play. So that's the only thing I can put it down to is Crouch hasn't been defending as hard as Nix would like. And then Barry, a guy who averaged 40 last year from very limited CBAs, he had 16%. Uh, opportunity in the midfield and quite low time on ground that increased up to 66% this year. So he's getting more opportunity in there and he's just a tackling machine, very low disposals for the amount of tackles that he gets. And you see players like that, like a Hugh Greenwood, Matt Rao. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit on the fence with Barry. Haven't seen, we still haven't seen a high disposal game from him. We've just seen consistently really high tackle numbers. So his ceiling is, it doesn't look like it's going to be that high, but uh, his floor is going to be pretty good because you, your tackle numbers tend to be pretty consistent throughout a year. But if you're having a quiet game disposal wise, that's when the fluctuation in scoring can happen uh, with these guys that don't have the tackles, but he does. And hopefully that'll lead to more consistent scoring. The key fantasy roles, um, I'm going to be breaking it down. These are Basically, in fantasy, the players that you're going to be looking for are inside midfielders, your main rebounding halfbacks, and your rucks. They're the guys. If you like, if you can get a forward that's playing in the ruck or halfback or midfield, generally they're going to be a top six forward. Likewise, if you can get a defender that's playing inside mid, there's there's a ranking of positions, um, and it basically goes forwards uh, the lowest ranked, then um, halfbacks sort of into rucks and then inside midfielders, but more on that later. The key fantasy roles for the Adelaide Crows, the kick-ins, we've got Dawson taking 36% of the kick-ins, a little bit lower than I would have uh, expected. Maybe he just can't get back there in time, but Brody Smith as well is, is a really good kick, probably comparable kick to Dawson. We'll see. Maybe with Smith moving on uh, age-wise in his career, when he retires, Dawson might get even more kick-ins, but as you can see, it's not it's not massive. Like thirty six percent of the kick ins equates when you take into account. Uh, sometimes they don't play on, so they don't get a stat for it. But taking into account when they play on, it equates to three kicks per game for Dawson. So nine points still handy. Like that's that's actually the difference between a a good pick and a bad pick a lot of the time. But it just goes to show that kick ins aren't everything, and then you still need to be able to win the ball from the opposition with intercepts, scramble gets, and then also be a good option for that uncontested possession from your teammates. And the ruck contest, as I've touched on already, O'Brien dominant ruckman, 87% CBAs, 87% of the ruck contests, and the most ruck contests per game of any ruck in the competition, but um, only winning 46% of the hitouts, which is 23rd. So if he could bump up the amount of hitouts he wins, he's going to get heaps of opportunity. If he was winning hitouts at the rate that like a Gorn or a Witz or a Proust does, then he'd he'd bump his average over 100 quite comfortably, but he's just not quite winning enough hitouts to be that like top, top ruck at the moment. Now for the midfield rotations. This was quite interesting at Adelaide. They, um, I'll touch on the trends to start. So they always had four midfielders. It was it was pretty good and interesting looking back at it. Some teams fluctuate. Some teams are really set on three or four. Adelaide always had four mids, but those the mids that were in that group of four changed quite a bit. The one consistent was Laird. He missed the first two games of the year and had slightly lower time on ground in his comeback games. But after three, four games, he was a full-time mid. As you can see, he averaged 78% CBAs from 78% time on ground. Um, for those that don't know, CBAs is a center bounce attendance. So anytime there's a center bounce, start of the quarter or after a goal, if you're inside the center circle, this includes the ruck, but obviously I've put Riley O'Brien and I'll put the other ruckman in the ruck category, but a CBA is for any of the other midfielders that are inside the center square at a center bounce. Obviously there's not like, it's quite a small percentage of the game, the actual center bounce interaction and contest, but generally if you're one of the midfielders playing in that center bounce, it means that you're playing as an inside mid at that point in time. 
and generally the percentage that guys get of center bounces, there are some exceptions. There's some guys that have higher center bounces um, than they play midfield time, like um, Jordan Degoe, uh, a few forwards go in there for the center bounce. Pickett from Melbourne, he goes into the center bounce and then he'll go forward and he'll play forward for the rest of the quarter, but they just want him in there to try and get that really valuable center bounce clearance. But generally, the percentage of center bounces that you get is the percentage of midfield that you're playing. So we can see for Rory Laird, 78% center bounces, 78% time on ground. He plays 100% of his game time as an inside midfielder. He's the number one scorer in the game. So that makes sense. Key's a little bit more interesting. He played all 22 games, 69% center bounces, but he had 84% time on ground. So there was a decent chunk of his game that he wasn't playing as an inside midfielder. And that mainly came towards the end of the year um, where he actually got pushed out by Jake Saligo, who's a player I'm, I'm quite a big fan of. I'm not sure he's quite there as an inside mid, but maybe Nick's just having a look at him, giving him an opportunity to see what it's like at AFL level playing in that inside mid, because potentially long-term, he would be a really good inside mid, a little bit small. Um, and at the moment, I think he's just more valuable on the outside because the Crows don't really have anyone else that can play on the wing and whose game suits the wing. Barry, I touched him a little bit before, 18 games. He didn't play the first four, I think. Yeah, it would have been four, actually. Didn't play the first four. Sloan did his ACL in the fourth game, but, it, yeah, it's true. You have to look closely at it because he, in the fourth game that he did his ACL, he wasn't in any center bounces. So prior to the injury, Nix had actually decided to push him. I think he played forward that game. And Barry got his center bounce attendances instead of Sloan. So prior to the injury, it wasn't like Sloan got injured and then Barry took his spot. Barry was actually given the position ahead of Sloan and then he got injured. So that's something that maybe some people might not have picked up on. But Barry was actually given the midfield time ahead of Sloan, which just gives you an indication of the way that Nix is looking. Sloan, I think 32 heading into the next year. So looking to the future, young team uh, towards the bottom of the ladder who's looking to improve. He wants to get the game time into the younger guys. Now, Crouch, he started the season playing midfield, quite low time on ground, ended up still averaging pretty much uh, as many CBAs as time on ground. So he was pretty much playing as a full-time mid when he did play, but he only played half the games. So, and he was in and out of the team. Basically, the way it went down with the Crows midfield was Laird was a lock the whole way through. Keys was basically a lock the whole way through until a couple of games where he was pushed out for Saligo. And then Berry started slowly, but towards the end of, was a full-time midfielder. So you had three guys basically as full-time mids. And then between Crouch, Schoenberg, and Sloan, it looks like they were fighting it out. Obviously, um, Sloan only had four games before his injury. And then Berry took his spot. But Schoenberg and Crouch were kind of wrestling for that fourth midfield spot. And next year, when Sloan comes back from his ACL, I think that he'll be in contention for that fourth midfield spot as well. So that's how I see it unfolding. I see Ad Adelaide's next uh, midfield next year being Laird, Keys, Berry, and then one of Slo uh, Sloan, Crouch, and Schoenberg. I'm leaning towards Schoenberg because towards the end of the year, he was the one that Nix settled on as being the fourth midfielder. And if that's anything to go by, it shows that maybe he favours him a little bit more than Crouch. We don't know if he favours him more than Sloan because Sloan wasn't available, but we'll find out throughout the preseason. Uh, now for list changes, there wasn't anything significant and really nothing fantasy relevant for the Crows. They brought in Rankin, traded out their pick five in the draft. Rankin originally a pick three to the Gold Coast Suns. And he comes into the forward line Pretty much a straight swap for James Rowe, um, who played about 16 games. And then there were like dribs and drabs in the forward line as well. But basically a straight swap. Rowe goes out of the team. Rankin comes in, immediately makes the team better. Um, Luke Brown also retired. Smaller defender. And I've got Worrell coming in for him. Worrell's 190 centimeter, uh, 2019 draft. So coming into his fourth year, I think. Really strong. Like actually... Only played four games, but ranked elite for intercept possessions. Kicks the ball well long. Didn't see him kick a single short kick when I was watching vision of him. But yeah, it looks, like, looks strong in the contest, looks brave, can take intercept marks, and looks like a competitor. So I think, um, especially with the way that the Adelaide team's looking, Nick seemed to love the guys that are just brave, strong, competitive, 
don't mind the physical stuff. He likes guys that tackle and spoil and really compete and make it tough for the opposition. Lastly, I've got Luke Pedler. Um, he was pick 11 back in 2020. Hasn't had heaps of opportunities. Only played a handful of games at AFL level, but had some big games in the Sandfall last year. And I've got him coming in for Lockie Murphy. Apparently had a really big preseason. And he was a guy that was probably on the cusp anyway. Uh, once again, just bringing that physicality and tackling pressure bringing some strength to the forward line, Rankin, classier player, um, not as much of a tackler, uh, same with Rochelle, he's more of a finisher, so Pedler probably provides a bit more grunt, brings the ball to ground, a little bit like what Sam Pellpepper does for Port Adelaide across, uh, across the town, I don't know anything about the geography in Adelaide, but um, similar role, just really big bodied forward who brings physicality, um, intimidates opposition defenders and brings the ball to ground and then tackles hard. So if, as for the best 22, I only really got three changes. I did an earlier prediction of the best 22 last year. And judging from the comments, I went and watched some vision of some players and they impressed me. Worrell was one of them. He was one that I hadn't really considered, but based on the comments from the previous Crows video, um, I, I was quite impressed with him. And he, yeah, from what you guys were saying, like Chase Jones, he is a neat player, but he doesn't really bring that physicality. And that's something I really liked about Worrell's game. So he comes into the 22 and then I've got Rankin, obviously, comes straight into that forward line. Really good pickup, classy guy. Uh, improves just their class and finishing forward of centre. And hopefully, they'll bring more goals. They're really competitive, yeah, high-pressure team. And hopefully, they can start to convert that a little bit more into scores moving forward. I've got Miller. I don't think he was in my original 22 either. But I can see him um, slotting into halfback. With the back line I've got at the moment, it's a little bit tall and maybe lacking a little bit of speed and rebound. So Miller provides that. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, Pedler uh, playing off the bench will be playing that pressure forward role. So wrapping up, the guys that I think you should genuinely be considering from Adelaide, uh, I think Rory Laird is actually a good option. It is tricky. Like, Last or two seasons ago, um, when Steele and Miller finished the year well, it's becoming a little bit of a pattern. These really dominant midfielders, when they're sort of the only good mid, basically, in a team that's outside finals, they can go on a really strong run to finish the year, especially when their team's out of finals contention. They're not really competitive. They sort of run amok and opposition don't pay them too much attention because there's no point there's no point tagging a midfielder from a team that you're going to beat anyway that's not making finals and they're not really competitive apart from this one guy who's just running around getting 35 touches so if Adelaide become more competitive personally I still can't see Rory Laird getting tagged I don't think he's the type that really will get tagged very similar to the way Tom Mitchell plays I really like his tackling game I think that his um, scoring is sustainable Based on those high tackles, his high disposals, it was only his second and a half season basically playing inside midfielder. So he'll keep improving and he's just proven over his whole career that he's a fantastic scorer. So I think if, if he does drop, he'll only drop five points down to a 115 average. Because of that, you can lock him in as a top eight mid and there's not many guys that you can do that. And he's just a walk-up captain start. Didn't go under 90 at all last year. And his... I, like, yeah, didn't go under 90. He had four scores between 90 and 110. But apart from that, apart from his four lower scores, he didn't go under 110, which is ridiculous. I think we might even see even more of that. He broke his hand at the start of preseason. Not really an interrupted preseason because you can still run. So he's not losing any conditioning. Maybe lost a little bit of touch. And then his lower scores were at the start of the year. So potentially a little bit of upside, not much upside, but... You don't need heaps of upside if you can lock. If you know he's going 120, I think you pick him straight away because you know he's going to be, if not the top, then one of the top scorers in the game. I'm at the moment. I'm a little bit conflicted. I'm he's competing with a guy like Jack Steele um, or Callum Mills for me. Maybe even Tom Mitchell who, who comes at a massive discount, but uh, uh, Collingwood's game style not nearly as conducive to fantasy as Adelaide is. If Mitch was playing for Adelaide, he'd probably average 150. Jordan Dawson, a guy I haven't actually considered really. It's only really looking at the Adelaide guys. I've started to consider him a little bit more heavily. It's probably natural. It probably will happen with all of the teams that I look at. The thing that got me is I didn't realize how few kick-ins he got. So he's only getting nine points a game from kick-ins. 
and he's getting quite a few intercept possessions. He's getting more tackles than I thought he was. And his ability to sort of convert his game and be versatile when he's getting tagged, when he's not getting easy ball on the outside, he was able to tackle. He was able to win the ball back from the opposition. So I really like that. I just think 100 is quite a high price to pay for a defender, especially with a lot of uncertainty around defenders. I'll probably go a little bit lower with defenders. I'll probably avoid everyone, uh, all of that top group, because you, you just don't know. Um, Doherty's the only one, as for most coaches that I'm considering. But once again, you, you just don't know. You're like, you don't know if a midf- he potentially moving into the midfield. Anyway, this is not about Carlton. I'll talk in depth about Doherty when I get to Carlton pod. Sam Berry, as I touched on a bit before, like, he looks like a good potential breakout. The thing that worries me is he his high score is 118. And for a guy that averaged nine and a half tackles, he only averaged 19 disposals per game. I'm a little bit worried about that. And looking back at his previous scoring, he's never really been a high disposal guy. All of his big scores have been on the back of tackles. And he's in the perfect team to score heaps from tackles. And he's still not getting those massive scores. So... He'd have to be very, very consistent, like super, super consistent to average around that 9,500 mark. I think he's capable of it. He looks like that sort of guy, and I'll, I'll be watching him really closely in the preseason. He's the same price bracket as guys like Tom um, Tom Green from GWS, Caleb Sarong. Um, there's a bunch of them around that particular price, and they'll all be competing with each other. Row bottom, Warner. So it's it basically who looks best in the preseason, who looks like they're going to avoid the tag, playing in a team that will support their style of game plan, which that's one thing that Barry has going for him is his game style is perfect for the way that Adelaide want to play. So I think he'll be a lock in the midfield. It's just whether he can win enough disposals to push his average over 100. Pedler, I touched on, pretty much covered this already. He's just a really strong, competitive guy. Um, picked as a midfielder, but looks like they want to play him as a forward. Could potentially push into the midfield. I actually like him as a midfielder because he adds a little bit of a point of difference. He's a longer kick. He can probably come out the front of the stoppage more than these smaller guys. So I like that, but might have to start in the forward line and really cheap with forward status. He's a no-brainer if he does get picked and if it looks like he's being preferred over guys like the Yeah. You know, I don't know how to explain it, but if yeah, if there's not too many guys competing for his position, basically, which sounds obvious to say, then you'll pick him. And a bit of a smoky, a guy, Zach Taylor, he was at, he was at my favorite player from last year's draft. Like apart from the obvious, like Nick Dacos is a generational talent. Um, probably will will be my favorite player for the next fifteen years. But apart from the obvious one, Zach Taylor was my favorite player. I ranked him in the top ten for that draft. He was a good junior scorer. He averaged about 100, finished the junior year really, really strongly. Big scores. He plays like Lockie Neal. Uh, he's really creative. The only thing is he's really small. And Adelaide have heaps of small midfielders, and he's not physically strong. Like, he, he's small, and he's also skinny. Like, Berry and Laird are short, but they're very stocky and powerful. Taylor is not, he's still quite skinny, but he's very, very skillful. He's very creative. He's a really good decision maker, creative handball, creative kick, can kick off both feet, really agile with his sidestepping, but he needs to put on size, particularly playing in this team with the high tackle numbers, the high congestion, high stoppage. I think he might take a couple of years, but you know, keeper leagues, or if you're looking for someone longer term, he's a guy, I think, just keep an eye on him. Average 75, I think, in the sample. And if he does get picked, he's someone that can come in and score, I think, from the get-go. He's got that natural game, but maybe a little bit undersized. Anyway, that's uh, all from me. Thank you very much for listening. This was basically a whole day of prep. Put a lot of research into this. I hope you enjoyed it. And like, subscribe, follow along if you haven't already. I'll see you next time uh, on Leatherheads Footy.